Well, good morning. What a joy it is to be here this day. Thank you for being present as we celebrate our Lord together. If you haven't done so already, I hope you'll take a moment to sign in on the registration pads and then pass those on to your neighbor. If someone slips in, I hope you'll help them sign in as well. Well, you might have heard this story. It's an older story about the pastor who goes and calls on a church member that hadn't been in worship for a while. And the church member says, oh, I know, pastor, I haven't been there, but, I, you know, I just, I just don't understand the value of being in church week after week after week. And, and the pastor was sharing, oh, well, it's important. You know, we miss you when you're gone. You add something to the worship experience. It's about building community, building a relationship with God, and, you know, expounded on some of the reasons why uh, it is beneficial to go to church and how much uh, a difference his presence makes. They were going back and forth, bantering back and forth uh, for a while, and, and it was a cool, crisp day, and so the church member had a fire going in the fireplace, and so while the pastor was talking, he reaches in with the poker, and he pulls one of those bright embers out of the fireplace and onto the hearth. Well, immediately, that ember went from glowing red to ashen color. It had lost the source of its fire, so quickly it was cooling. And the pastor said, you know, going to church is a lot like this ember. When we are in there with the community, we are hot, we are on fire. But when we pull back and pull ourselves away, we've lost the source of our inspiration. And that's what happens when we're not together in church. Well, he got it at that point. So today we continue our sermon series on Live United. As we look at that vow we took when we became United Methodists to support the church with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. It's not a multiple choice question. So today we're going to look at presence, the importance of being a part of the community of faith. So let's begin this time of worship. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are beyond our knowing, yet closer to us than our very breath. You are before us and behind us, and yes, even in the middle of our chaos, surrounding us with your love. With every thought, with every song, with every prayer, Turn these fragile earthen vessels of our lives into the spirit-filled body of Christ, reshaping us with your love and equipping us for service. This we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to invite you now to stand as we join together in our call to worship. When Jesus called his disciples, he said, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Yes, Lord, we will follow. But then he tells us, And whosoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. It sounds so simple, but it is not easy. And finally, we hear these words. Those of you who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciples. Yes, but Christ is with us as our protector and guide. Then let us take up our cross and follow Jesus. Amen. Our hymn of praise this morning is hymn number 88, Maker in Whom We Live. Thank you.
as one body, let us affirm our faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. I invite you now to be seated as we invite our children and Emily to come down for our children's time. You guys are in for a really great cook. Did y'all know that about me? Did y'all know that? I love to cook. And so I baked you guys some freshly baked chocolate chip cookies. Is there anything better? They might still be warm. Cinnamon cookies next time, okay? Cake is better than, okay. But the, I made some chocolate chip and they're maybe, I mean, delicious. You, you wanna, you wanna, are you ready? You want one? You want one? Okay. Oh, oh, that's not cookies. What is it? It's just chocolate chips. What did I forget to do? <laughs> All the rest of it, right? But the chocolate chips are the best part. No? They're actually white chocolate. I didn't have any chocolate chips. It's fine, okay. <laughs> the chocolate chip is the best part of the cookie, though, right? Don't you think? Is it, it's not very much fun to measure out the flour and add the butter. You got to wait for it to soften and all that. It's way easier to just go grab a Chips Ahoy cookie out of the pantry, right? So, and even once you make the dough, you got to wait for them to cook, right? You could just buy them from the store, but you, you think they taste as good as homemade cookies? You do? Okay, yeah, okay, fine. Um, you could. So what we're talking about today in church is our presence, and even when we are tired and don't really feel like coming to church, or if you're doing a special project, Natalie, like um, when we did the pet project last spring, or we made the pet toys, no, you don't remember? Okay, never mind, it's fine. Um, when we are doing a special project for God to help other people, even when it's hard sometimes being present and doing what he wants us to do, it's worth it, right? Like we can't just only do the fun part or the beginning part. We have to be there for the long haul. He wants you to be there for all of it. He don't want you to be there for just the easy parts or just part of it. He wants you to stick with it and measure out the flour and wait for the butter to soften and add the chocolate chips and then wait for the cookies to bake. But it's just not easy to do that all the time. But it's worth it. Or you could just go to the store. That's called the easy route. <laughs> okay, let's say a quick prayer. <laughs> Dear God, please help us even when things are hard and we are tired. We want to do your will and stay on your path. 
Amen. And eat chocolate chip cookies. Thank you. Well, part of being living united as a church community means that it takes all of us working together to make things happen in the life of the church. And so sharing his testimony today is our lay leader, Richard Bushnell. Good morning. First United Methodist Church, 175 years of stewardship. Still giving back to the community our time, our presence, our offerings, and expressing stewardship throughout the community. I remember once, several years ago, when I first came into this church, Mr. Paul Adams was standing right here. And he gave his testimony or what he thought about stewardship and giving to the church. He said that either once a month or maybe once a week, his father would give he and his brothers coins, just a few coins, and one coin would be larger. And that coin was to go in the collection plate. And he said, I thought that coin is going straight to God. And he said, I would polish on my coin and make sure that it was shiny and pretty when it went in the plate. And you know, I couldn't help but think those coins that went in that plate are probably it was used for some of the things that we have today that we're using in this church or in this community. It's, I would like to have been or uh, had this recorded when he spoke. He spoke so humbly and such a was a big man. And I will remember that so very well. As Claire pointed out last week, you know, I've always thought stewardship was what? Giving money. Claire pointed out something else. They came, they visited our church, they visited other churches, and she said, because the people here were so friendly, they chose our church. Stewardship. Stewardship is not just the tithing. It's very important for our church to have tithes, but it's also many things that center around the family, the community, and spreading the teachings of Christ doing as he would want us to do. Think for, of what has been done in 175 years. It's still going strong. It's our church today, First United Methodist Church. We recently visited the church that had, had been our prior church. I'd only been there one time, and that was when I was a child and it was a wedding and I remember that wedding but I remembered how beautiful that church was and something was different you could feel the presence of God something is different here as well we have the presence of God with us this is part of our stewardship that we share one with another it is a comfortable place to worship our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're visiting today, we not only welcome you, but we invite you to become part of our church family. Thank you. Let us pray. Lord, we ask that you fill us with humility so that we can follow you better. Discipleship is so hard, but you are a God of miracles. You are a God worth following, even today, in today's times. And we need humility to follow you. We need humility to know we are sinners. We need humility 
to acknowledge your grace in our lives. Help us to make church not just a box that we check off. Help us to make church something that we need. We need to be fed. Because Jesus, you don't just want us to get into heaven. You want to dwell with us now. You want to be in our lives now. And so we ask that you come to each of us, speak to us during this worship service, and help us all to show up. Help us to worship you with ease. Help us to share our blessings with one another. For it is in Jesus' name we pray and sing. Amen. Gary, can you turn my mic down a little? I wasn't yelling, y'all, I promise. Thank you.
Thank you, choir. You know, one of the greatest gifts we can give when, it, when we're talking about our presence, being there for one another, that is one of the things that the community of faith offers. We show up. We show up when someone has a need. We show up, and we show up in our prayers for one another. And so today, I just invite you to not just lift those that you are aware of, uh, but to pray for those in our faith community that stand in the need of prayer. Uh, we've been praying for Bill Owens and for his healing. And so continue to surround Nancy and Bill with your prayers. Uh, George and Ramna uh, are here today, and they've been away because uh, Ramna's mom passed away. Ramna, we are praying for you in this time and in this season. And there are others standing in the need of prayer. So I invite you uh, to pray for those you know about, but those within our faith community uh, who have concerns that we might never be aware of, but the Lord knows their need. And prayer is one of the greatest ways that we can show up for one another. We have some celebrations today, though, too. Nanette Walton and Rhonda Atwood both had birthdays this week. So, Nanette, happy birthday. Uh, we thank you for your life and your life among us. And so we celebrate uh, that gift of your birthday and the gift of you being present this day. And so as we go to the throne of grace, let us pray. God of mercy and compassion, we are broken vessels. You have watched us. You have called to us. You have blessed us, and yet we have chosen our own flawed ways, hoping that there was an easier path to you. Help us, Lord. Help us to tune our ears and our hearts to you. Help us to seek peace and justice rather than greed and complacency. As we have gathered here this morning to listen to your word, to sing praises to your glory, to offer up our prayers, help us to remember that you hold us closely and dearly in your hands. You cherish our lives and listen to our cries. You respond to our needs. You search us and know us. So forgive us. Forgive us when we have refused to take up our cross and to bear the burdens that are ours to carry. Forgive us when we have not given up on our attachment to things and possessions and to self. Forgive us when we have turned our backs on situations of need in which we could have been instruments of help or healing or peace. Forgive us when we have neglected service to others and have focused our lives on accumulating stuff and status. We have chased after false gods, so forgive us for our greed, our power, and our fame that we seek from others. We have not counted the cost of walking into an unknown future with you, O oh Lord. So enable us to place our trust in you totally, that we may faithfully pick up our cross and follow you. In the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. So as we look at that vow, prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness, today we're going to talk about presence. What does it mean to be present, to show up for Christ and for one another? What does it mean to be a disciple? It sounds so simple, but it is not easy. As Jesus tells us in Luke 14, beginning at verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and yes, even their own life. Such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple either. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it is going to ridicule you by saying, this person was planning to build and they began it and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he will be able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000 men. If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciple. Let us pray. Almighty God, still the busyness of our minds and open our hearts to you that we may hear your word for us this day. Amen. So I'm sure we've all seen those comment cards around. They come in various forms. Sometimes they're, they're sitting at the, the table of the restaurant or there's a QR code that you scan with your phone and you can leave a comment about how your service was or how the food was. We're driving down the interstate. We see those 18-wheelers and it says, How's my driving? And it gives you an 800 number that you can call. Or... Um, a lot of times when you're in a department store, on the receipt, if you look, you can get 10% off, you can get a coupon by going online and uh, making comment about uh, how your service was, how the cashier was, or how you found the quality of whatever it was that you were buying. So people actually really do fill those things out. So here are some actual responses from some comment cards that were given to staff members at the Bridger Wilderness area. This is a 428,000 acre uh, wilderness area in Wyoming. So here's what they said about their wilderness experience. Uh, Trails need to be reconstructed to avoid going uphill. Too many bugs, leeches, and spiders. Please consider spraying the wilderness area for bugs. Uh, Pave the trails. They are too rough and stumpy. Uh, Chairlifts are needed to see some of the places uh, to get up to see the views without having to hike. And then I think my personal favorite, there are too many rocks in the mountains. I guess these folks didn't really know what it meant to have a wilderness experience or to hike in a wilderness area. They wanted a wilderness experience, but they didn't want to break a sweat. They didn't want to be inconvenienced or suffer any hardship. Well, that is the same thing that is going on in this morning's scripture. 
So they wanted to follow Jesus. Those people that were the crowd that was gathered with Jesus, they, they wanted to follow him. But they didn't want to risk anything. They didn't want to be inconvenienced or uncomfortable or suffer any hardships. Just, I can just imagine that scene. Think, think about that for a moment. You know, here's Jesus walking down the road. He's the new guy in town. He's beginning to collect a few followers in addition to his disciples. And, and so, you know how we are when we walk, we talk, and there's this chatter going on. The men over here are kind of grouped together, and, and they're talking about kind of the things that they have seen. Hey, you know... I, I saw Jesus the other day. I, I can't believe it. You know, this is the guy that has healed the leper. It's pretty amazing. I wonder what else he can do. And the guy beside him says, yeah, yeah, I saw that. I even saw him spit on a guy that was blind. And after he spit on him, he could see. <laughs> I wonder what would happen to Caesar if he spit on him. I'd like to be a fly on the wall to see that happen. Well, the women then are over here, you know, and they're chit-chatting it up. And they said, man, do I want to be a part of this crew following Jesus because I'm never going to have to cook again. Uh, did you hear? He fed 5,000 the other day and there were leftovers. And then the other one says, yeah, that's pretty amazing. This guy walks on water. I wonder if he has a brother. <laughs> They all want to follow Jesus. They all want to be a part of this, this thing that is happening right before their very eyes. They want to be there in the middle. They hear, they even say, you hear them say, yeah, this is the guy that's going to change our life forever because he's going to overthrow the government. That's what I'm talking about. I want to follow him. Can you just hear it? Can you hear it going down? All these folks excited about the new guy, about this guy called Jesus. They're dazzled by his miracles. They, they are amazed by what they are hearing him teach. They want to come along for the ride. Every one of them traveling with Jesus that day was looking for an easy button, was looking for the easy life. They wanted to change their human condition, and they thought Jesus was just the guy to do it. He was their golden ticket into a new way of living. But then all of a sudden, Jesus turns around because they weren't getting it. They didn't understand what he was offering them. He basically said to them, hanging out with me doesn't make you my disciple any more than parking in your garage makes you a car. But he says it this way. If anyone comes to me and does not hate their father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters... Yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now, I know we're kind of taken aback by that word hate, right? We think hating our mother, father, brother, sister, spouse, children. It's like, well, I can't hate those people. Because in today's culture, hate is a feeling that we have. We eat something we don't like, the taste... I hate it. I never want to eat it again. Someone does us wrong on the schoolyard and we say, I, I hate that person. I never want to have to hang out with them again. Or we hate our job. We hate the fact that we have to show up to it tomorrow. Hate in today's culture is a feeling that we don't want to have anything to do with that person, place, or thing. But in Scripture, how Jesus is using it is not about feeling. It's not about an emotion. It's about our priorities, the kind of priorities that we set. The Greek word that is used here means that our earthly ties that we have are subordinate to our devotion to God. So our earthly ties to family are subordinate to our tie to the Heavenly Father. 
that that it comes first, God first, then family and all the other stuff. That's what Jesus is meaning when he says, you hate mother and father, spouse and child, brother and sister. He just means that you put God first and family second. There's a story about a man who wanted to leave a legacy centuries ago in an old mountain village. The way he did it was by building them a beautiful church. He didn't show them the plans at first at all, and he kept it a secret. No one could come in and tell the church was finished and finally the day came they walked in and they were just amazed in the beauty of the sanctuary marble floors gold inlay on the altar pews made of the finest wood they were in awe of what they were seeing this was back before electricity when you could just flip a switch and turn the lights on and and they realized it's getting pretty dark in there. How in the world are, were they going to, in all of this opulent beauty, see what they were doing? There was no lamps. The builder says, ah, well, that's the thing. I have one of these beautiful lamps for every single family in this church. And what you do is that when you come to church, you bring your lamp. And your lamp will light up where you sit and also help others that are seated around you that may not have brought a lamp or might be visiting and don't have a lamp. When you're not here, this place will go dark. But if you come, you will light up the room. Well, you know, that's the question we have to answer for ourselves today. When we made that vow to support the church with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, we made a promise to show up, to show up for worship, to show up for Bible study, to, to show up for the fun stuff too, like pumpkin unloading. Yeah, that was fun. We make a promise to show up so that we could build on our relationship with God and on our relationship with one another. You know, it's one thing that church has to offer that no other community organization offers one another. Showing up for each other. Because showing up means not just showing up for worship, but showing up for the person beside you in the pew or in front of you or behind you. To show up when there's been a death in the family. To show up when there's been a difficulty, a divorce, disaster, whatever it is. We made a promise to one another to be in covenant with not only our God, but to be in covenant with each other to help one another on this journey called life. That is what the church has to offer that no other place can. So is your lamp burning bright? Are you showing up? Are you all in? Are you lighting the way for the next generation? Christ is depending on us. He's depending on all of us to light the way, to put Christ first in our lives, above all our other earthly connections. Our commitment to Christ has to come before our hobbies and our sports and our teams and our careers and our goals in life and our self-interest before any other worldly concerns God comes first and when God comes first it's funny how all those worldly concerns tend to kind of fall away there's help in the in the battles of life and the chaos that we face we must love God more than any other commitment Worshiping God is not about convenience. Well, I'll come to church if it's nice outside or if it's not raining outside or if it's not too cold or if it's not too hot or if the pastor's not too boring. Uh, I, I'll come to church. But otherwise, mm, maybe I'll just roll over and hit the snooze button. 
Worshiping God is not about convenience. Worshiping God is about our commitment that we make. We must put Christ as our first priority, not the last resort if something else better comes along. But being a disciple comes with a warning label. We have to know the cost. Jesus reminds us, just like a builder won't start construction without first figuring out the cost, or a king wouldn't go to battle without knowing if he can win the war. There's a cost in being a disciple. David uh, Livingston, medical missionary and explorer to Africa, received a letter of support. He, he, it said, I have found... Uh, have you found a good road to where you are? I want to know if there's a way to get to you because I want to send some men to come help you in your work. To which David replied, If you have men who will come only if they know there is a good road, I don't want them. I want the men who will come if there is no road at all. Friends, Jesus is demanding, asking, begging for our absolute allegiance and our total loyalty. No half-hearted commitment, no wishy-washy dedication, no here today and gone tomorrow. No, Christianity is not just this Sunday morning religion, but it is a lifestyle. Christianity is a lifestyle where we are hungering after God. Martin Luther says that a religion that gives nothing, that costs nothing, that suffers nothing, is worth nothing. If we want the full benefit, the full benefit of Christ in our lives, then we must show up. We must show up for one another. And we must show up for Christ and give him our full commitment. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Lord, give us the courage to follow you into unknown places and spaces. Give us the courage to serve you and your people. And we know that can be risky business. But most of all, Lord... Give us the commitment and the courage to show up. This we pray in your name. Amen. So there are some great ways to show up this week and in weeks to come. Uh, of course, the patch is going uh, on outside. It will open up at 12. Thank you for all that helped this week and those who are signed up to show up uh, this, this next week as well. Uh, I got a counting today from Daphne so far. Total sales is $8,000. 3,000 of which we made yesterday alone. So we sold some pumpkins yesterday. So thank you for your commitment to that. And then uh, just a reminder, Trunk or Treat is next Sunday, 6 o'clock to 7.30. We need trunks. We need candy. We need treaters, uh, trick-or-treaters. We, we need all the things. So I hope you'll come and be a part of this. It's going to be a community event as we greet our neighbors and our kids. Bible study going on. There's an insert. Fear of the Other just got started Wednesdays at 6, Thursday mornings at 10.30. And then you also, if it didn't fall on the floor, uh, there's a little slip of paper. I am going to do a little 2023 uh, sermon planning next month. And I don't want to just preach the stuff I like to hear myself talk about. Uh, I want to preach the stuff you'd like to hear myself talk about. And uh, so I want your ideas, and you can slip those in the offering plate, you can slip those in my pocket, you can uh, send me an email instead if your list is very long, uh, it's anonymous, all that good stuff, but I want to, I'm looking for ideas for uh, preaching, so please share your ideas. And then 
Two Sundays from now, November the 6th, is our volunteer appreciation luncheon. Uh, your staff is hosting a catered meal to say thank you for all that you do to help us do church. So if you have ushed, sung in the choir, served on a committee, done flowers, served communion, you name it, you volunteered. We want to thank you. Basically, we're throwing a, a church-wide. Uh, no one's going to be turned away at the door. There's even a children's menu as well uh, to enjoy. So I hope that you will come and let us say thank you uh, for helping us in so many different ways to be the church to others. So one of the best ways, though, to connect and show up for each other is to say that this is going to be your church. And so if you're ready to join, uh, we would love to celebrate that decision with you as you come forward as we sing the closing hymn. But if that makes you nervous, then you can see me after the worship service. Elizabeth? I have a quick announcement, too. Yes. Uh, this Wednesday, we're starting our Christmas music. So um, if you'd like to join us, Christmas is a beautiful time of year, and you can experience more than just the joy and the warmth. You can actually deepen your connection to Christ this Advent season, and singing is a great way to do that. We're going to have six rehearsals and then the cantata, and it happens at this service, so you're already used to being here. Um, and then Christmas Eve is also super easy to join us for. You don't have to attend any rehearsals to join us for that. So I've asked the choir, after we get done singing this song, to all go find someone. Um, so if there's a choir member staring at you right now, don't be scared. If more than one comes to you, then that's a sign, okay? But um, what you're signing up for today is not the cantata. You're not signing up with your life here. Um, what you're signing up for is for me to give you a phone call so that we can talk about how you could help us. Um, it could be as simple as reading for the cantata if you promise you can't sing. Um, or it could be something as simple as just supporting us in another way. So... Don't be alarmed if someone comes after you. Don't run out the door. Um, let us pray. God, we know that you call each of us individually. You call us to serve. You call us to sing. You call us, no matter how we feel we sing, to worship you. And so we ask that you speak to each of us today and help us to accept that invitation to make Christmas more special for our entire congregation. In Jesus' name we pray and sing. Amen. Our closing hymn can be found in your hymnals, number 664, sent forth by God's blessing. That's number 664. Please stand.
Okay, so is anyone else excited about this row of youth getting bigger? Uh, so this is a good-looking group. Yes. <laughs> Love it. Love everything about it. Love that you're here today. Thank you. Thank you for choosing to worship here. You could have been a hundred other places. So thank you for showing up. I am grateful. And I'm going to send you forth with a blessing, with a word, with courage to be the light of Christ where you work, where you play, and where you live. And may the peace of God be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Happy birthday.